Rory and I were halfway up Cross Couloir, a huge snow chute on the eastern side of Colorado's Mountain of the Holy Cross, when the snowstorm rolled in almost a whole day early. That's when we knew we were in serious trouble. A few days prior, the TV weather forecast had told a completely different story. It reported a clear weather window well within our Thanksgiving break, which was one of our only opportunities to tick off the mountain of the Holy Cross from our climbing bucket list. We'd already bagged several of Colorado's mountains that winter, and we'd been eyeing Holy Cross's steep, snow-filled couloir for the previous year. Our plan was to stash some overnight gear at a base camp only a few miles from the start of our climb. From there, we'd go for the snow chute, and then hike out once it was night. We had planned to start the climb in the afternoon, when the snow was just about soft enough to provide our boots with grip. We arrived at the base of the snow chute at around noon. About 300 feet up, the snow was way deeper than expected, but the sky was a clear blue, we were on schedule, and the climb didn't seem like it was going to be too taxing. Additionally, we knew we'd have cell service on top of the peak. We didn't expect to need it, but we considered it a safety net. We were right about the cell service, but wrong about the two-hour climb. The higher we went, the deeper the snow became. Soon it was loose and powdery, all the way to the rock bed beneath. We were moving more slowly than expected, but if the weather held, we'd still make it up before dark. A few hours into the climb, slogging upward within the steep couloir walls, we didn't even notice the dark clouds moving in from the west. The first snows came about halfway through the afternoon. By 5.30 it was pounding down, with the wind drowning out our attempts to communicate. If there ever was a time to quit, that was it. But behind us, the snow was kicked out and slick from our climbing, way too unstable for any kind of descent. So, we went with our only viable option, pushing on towards the summit and descending the much easier north ridge as quickly as we could manage. We tried to focus on keeping calm and pushing onward as darkness fell around us. The blizzard flashed through our headlamp beams and pelted our faces with ice. When I looked down at Rory, the terrified look in his eyes perfectly matched how I felt. By the time we finally reached the summit, around 7 that evening, we figured the worst was over. We called our parents and told them that everything was fine and that we were going to commence the hike down. But when we looked around, we saw only sheer drop-offs and total darkness. There was no way for us to find our descent, which is dangerously easy to miss, even in daylight. Plus, the wind up top was blowing something fierce, making it equally hazardous to approach any steep drops. With no choice but to hunker down, we settled under an overhanging lip of rock below the summit to wait out the storm. We had what we were wearing, goose down jackets, insulated pants, hats and gloves, plus a little food and water. We prayed that it would be enough for us to survive. But despite our pleas to the Almighty, conditions soon worsened. Strong winds tore through our improvised shelter, and our feet grew agonizingly cold. We took off our boots and socks and put our feet in each other's armpits, massaging our toes to keep the feeling in them. I couldn't get my mind off of thinking about how my parents would react to the news that we'd died up there that night. That's when the severity of our situation started to really dawn on me. We'd been feeling pretty cocky up until this point, but now I was truly frightened. Temperatures dropped to negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit with the wind chill that night. I stopped shivering, a sign of hypothermia, but Rory and I stayed positive, and I'm convinced that was the only thing that got us through the night. I must have drifted off because the next thing I remember was the sun's warmth washing over us. Thankfully, the storm had passed, but the descent was still hard to find. We saw several ridges, and at the bottom of one we spotted what looked like East Cross Creek, which we'd walked along two days before. We repelled toward it, thinking we were home free, but when we reached the creek we realized that we accidentally had gone down the south ridge, the opposite direction of the trailhead, and the one thing we didn't want to do since at that point we'd lost all of our cell service. 
On the summit the night before, we were worried about surviving. Now we were just annoyed with ourselves, low on food and incredibly tired. Still, we were confident we were finding our way out. Below the tree line, we managed to pick up a trail that took us to a spot we thought we'd recognize as the east side of the mountain. We weren't ready to admit that our delirious minds may have been playing tricks on us. We followed faint trails through the forest, turning here and there as the compass dictated, but we always ended up back where we started. We later found out locals call the area the Bermuda Triangle of the Rockies. Iron deposits in the rock can throw off magnetic instruments, and our compass was taking us in circles. We knew we should have stayed put to wait for rescue, but we couldn't. With water-soaked boots, it was either move or lose appendages to frostbite. Our optimism was running dry. I start to feel a frog in my throat, but in those moments, you have to either crack a joke or cry. So we messed around, talked about girls, sang old Zeppelin songs, and laughed about whatever we could, any distraction to keep us going. As the sun went down on our second unplanned night out, we gathered tinder and took out our lighters. But to our absolute horror, they remained waterlogged with snowmelt. Despite our efforts to dry them, neither of us could get anything so much as a spark out of either of them. By this point, Rory was too weak to continue, so I piled pine branches on the snow for us to spoon on top of. We managed to laugh at a few cuddle jokes, but we were starting to realize that our families didn't even know if we were alive. That made it tough to keep things light. Soon we both stopped shivering, and neither of us could feel our feet. He turned to me. Dude, we could die out here, he said. I'm okay with it because I'm still glad not to be on the couch playing video games, but this is much earlier than I thought it would be. I'm not ready. We laid in silence. Rory fell asleep with his head on his right hand, a position that would cut off circulation just enough to give him frostbite on his thumb. Again, temperatures dropped below freezing and again we woke up in the morning, somehow still alive. We hadn't been hiking long when we saw a helicopter. It was distant, but for us, it took up the whole sky. Numb feet forgotten, we ran into a meadow, and I waved a jacket and a trekking pole with a bright red hat on it. The chopper flew right past us. It circled back four more times before flying off. We felt like we'd watched our last chance vanish, and that's when we finally broke down. There was nothing to say. Rory just laid his head on my lap and we both sobbed. An hour later, the helicopter returned. It had only turned back to refuel, and this time it came straight to us. We couldn't stop smiling. It was finally over. I was so elated I tried to hug a rescuer who just threw me onto a jump seat and strapped me in. We were told to look for bodies, he said. As soon as we threw off... I could feel the adrenaline drain out of me. My whole body was in pain. I'd been too numb to feel until now. But still, I'd never felt better. It was honestly one of the lowest, then highest points of my entire life. My name is Michael McGaskill, and I grew up in the very far north of Scotland in a place called Inverness. You may not have heard of my home city, but I'm willing to bet you've heard of the Scottish Highlands and its central tourist attraction, Loch Ness. But this story isn't about prehistoric monsters that live in deep lakes, which no one finds scary in the least bit. This story is about something very real and very possible that happened back when I was 19. Some of the coldest temperatures in the entire United Kingdom have been recorded around Inverness and the highlands that surround it. But with Inverness having the relatively low crime rate that it does, you wouldn't consider a night out in Inverness to be anything approaching dangerous. But danger is exactly what I found in the most unlikely of circumstances. It was the night of my best friend's 19th birthday. It wasn't as highly anticipated as our 18th birthdays, not by a long shot, 
But being of legal drinking age was something we still hadn't quite gotten bored of yet. So it went without saying that we'd be heading into Inverness City Center for a birthday bar crawl. We gathered at our newly 19-year-old pal's house on the Friday after his birthday for pre-drinks, a proud Scottish tradition that has the purpose of saving a few quid whilst fortifying you to brave the chilly night air in search of shots and skirt. A few hours go by and we're sitting in a taxi, hyping ourselves up to the chant of Here we, here we, here we effin go. Heck, even our driver joined in for a bit before wishing our pal a very happy 19th. As we climbed out of the cab and paid the driver, he wished us a safe evening and specifically told us to call him back instead of trying for a night bus, as it was about to dip below freezing point with the weather forecast saying the night would only get colder. So the night proceeds to zoom by faster than any of us could possibly fathom, with drinks flying off the bar tops and down our throats. I'm not quite sure how it happened, but I wandered off to the toilets of one particular club, and the next thing I remembered is waking up on one of the toilets, lid down. I'd sat down for a minute to send a text message or whatever, something involving my phone anyway, and I'd nodded off. When I walk out of the toilets, all the club staff are sat around the empty venue, looking at me like I'd just grown a second head. They had closed hours ago and were apparently relaxing with a few drinks of their own after having cleaned the place down. I apologized profusely for my intrusion, but they seemed to get pretty bloody annoyed at me, accusing me of hiding in the toilet so I could steal their tips. I can't help but think they were trying to cover for their own negligence at leaving me asleep in the labs after closing, but either way, they definitely weren't happy to see me and promptly kicked me out of the venue before locking the doors behind me. That's when I realized that my phone was dead. Not only that, but I'm stuck outside with only a few coins of change in my wallet and no warm clothing to keep the bitter winter at bay. Thanks to all the beer and vodka, I didn't really feel the cold at first. I just decided to walk towards the outskirts of town to try and hail a cab. Lack of funds wouldn't be a problem, really, since I could just promise the driver I'd pay him on arrival giving him my powerless phone as collateral or something. I mean, I'd done that before, and there was no reason to think I wouldn't be able to do it again. But as I was walking, all the black cabs I saw had their lights off. I tried pulling over a private hire, but the driver was furious when he realized what I was asking. No booking, no insurance, no taxi. He spat before driving off into the freezing night. That was about the time I realized just how cold it was. I was obviously beginning to sober up. The growing anxiety told me that much. I was sobering up and I was getting scared. The more I walked, the more frightened I got. There was absolutely no sign of any available cabs and any car I tried to thumb down just ignored me, probably assuming I was gearing myself to puke in their car or whatever. I wouldn't blame them usually, but... It was absolutely freezing outside, and all I had on was some tight white button-up shirt. I was shivering at that point, really bloody hard too, teeth chattering together so hard I thought they might chip. But I still kept walking, aimlessly just sort of hoping that I'd run into a taxi that'd be willing to take me home. When I finally used up the last of my energy, I remember sitting down on the pavement telling myself I'd rest for just a few minutes before carrying on. I had these awful dress shoes that were about half a size too small, and they were wreaking havoc on my toes. But as I sat down, I realized I wasn't shivering anymore. I actually kind of felt like I was starting to warm up. I remember being really, really sleepy by the time a car pulled up to the curb I was sitting on. The fellow driving stuck his head out of the window and asked me if I was all right. But as I tried to speak to him and asked him for a lift home, I found I could barely talk. I definitely wasn't that drunk, let alone drunk enough to have lost the power of speech. Remember how I had mentioned how I had sobered up for a fair bit? Yeah, that. Turns out I was in the initial stages of hypothermia. The driver seemed way too concerned about me as he got out of his car and pulled me into the passenger side and it was only about then that I realized that something was horribly wrong. Once he mentioned something about taking me to the hospital. 
I spent the rest of the night in a hospital bed, and doctors kept me as an inpatient for most of the following day too. They said that if I'd stayed on the street for a few more hours, if I had in fact fallen asleep on the pavement like it had felt like I was going to, I'd have died, plain and simple. It was minus four degrees when the guy found me, not even the coldest part of that night. I suppose what scares me is how close I came to death as a result of something completely innocuous. A bloody birthday night out. Something so regular it's almost boring could have ended with me lying in a coffin with my parents crying at a graveside. We're scheduled to play a match against the old boys club, an English rugby team in Santiago, Chile. The president of the Uruguayan rugby club rented a small twin turboprop airplane from the Uruguayan Air Force to fly the team over to the Andes Mountains to the Chilean capital. The aircraft carried a total of 40 passengers and 5 crew members and was piloted by an experienced Air Force pilot who had more than 5,000 flying hours to his name. Colonel Julio Cesar Ferradas, the aircraft's pilot, had previously flown across the Andes almost 30 times. He was so comfortable with the journey that on this particular flight, he was training his co-pilot, who was the pilot in command when the plane took off from Carrasco International Airport on the 12th of October 1972. But Ferradas was wrong to be so complacent, and the flight would spark off a chain of events that would culminate in almost unimaginable horror. On the day of the flight, excessive cloud cover meant that the pilots were forced to fly under what is known as instrument meteorological conditions. This means that instead of using visual references to navigate, the pilots were reliant on their aircraft's instruments to discern their current location and altitude. Essentially, they were flying blind. Inexplicably, at 3.21 p.m., shortly after transiting the Planchon Pass, which was part of their planned flight path, the co-pilot contacted Santiago air traffic controllers and notified them that he expected to reach Chirico a minute later. The flight time from the Planchon Pass to Chirico is normally 11 minutes, but only three minutes later the pilot told Santiago that they were passing Chirico and turning north. He requested permission from air traffic control to land the aircraft. The controller in Santiago, unaware the flight was still over the Andes, authorized him to descend. As the aircraft descended, severe turbulence tossed the aircraft up and down. The rugby players joked about the turbulence at first, until some passengers saw that the aircraft was extremely close to the mountain. That was probably the moment when the pilots saw the black ridge of the Chilean Andes rising dead ahead. The airplane's ground collision alarm sounded, sending many of the passengers into a panic. The pilot applied maximum power in an attempt to gain altitude, but later evidence indicated the plane had struck the mountain either two or three times, one of which severed the aircraft's right wing. Some evidence indicates it was thrown back with such force that it tore off the vertical stabilizer in the tail cone. When the tail cone was detached, it took with it the rear portion of the fuselage, including two rows of seats in the rear section of the passenger cabin, leaving a gaping hole in the rear of the fuselage. Three passengers... The navigator and the steward were lost with the tail section. The aircraft continued hurtling forward and upward another 200 meters for a few more seconds when the left wing struck an outcropping, ripping it clean off. One of its propellers sliced through the fuselage as the wing it was attached to was severed, causing another two more passengers to fall out of the open rear of the fuselage. The front portion of the fuselage flew straight through the air before sliding down a kilometer-long steep slope at over 200 miles per hour, almost like a high-speed toboggan before colliding with a snowbank. The impact against the snowbank crushed the cockpit and the two pilots inside, killing the more experienced Ferratus instantly. Out of a total of 45 passengers on the aircraft, three passengers and two crew members in the tail section were killed when it broke apart. A few seconds later, two additional passengers fell out of the rear fuselage when it was torn open by the rogue propeller. One survived the fall, 
but stumbled down the snow-covered glacier, fell into deep snow, and was asphyxiated. At least four more died from the impact of the fuselage hitting the snowbank, which ripped the remaining seats from the anchors and hurled them to the front of the plane. The pilot died instantly when the nose gear compressed the instrument panel against his chest, forcing his head out the window while the co-pilot was critically injured and trapped in the crushed cockpit. He asked one of the passengers to find his pistol and shoot him, but the passenger refused. Thirty-three remained alive, although many were grievously injured with wounds ranging from broken legs to having metal embedded in their bodies. Two of the passengers happened to be second-year medical students at Montevideo University and acted quickly to assess the severity of people's wounds and treat those that they could help most. Many may have believed at the time that the worst was behind them, but the short, sharp shock of the crash paled in comparison to the long, slow agony of being trapped on a snow-covered mountain and the horrors they would endure as a result. The survivors had extremely little food, obviously being unprepared for such a disaster. They only had eight chocolate bars, one tin of mussels, three small jars of jam, a tin of almonds, a few dates, candies, dried plums, and several bottles of wine. During the days following the crash, they divided this into very small amounts to make their meager supply last as long as possible. One survivor ate a single chocolate-covered peanut over three days. Even with their strict rationing of supplies, food stocks began to dwindle quickly, exacerbated by the fact that there was no natural vegetation or animals on the nearby snow-covered mountain. Food officially ran out after just a week. As a result, the group tried to eat parts of the airplane, such as the cotton inside the seats and leather, but this only made them sick. Ten days after the crash, facing starvation and death, the remaining survivors mutually agreed that if they died, the others could use their bodies for sustenance. They had found their ticket to survival, and horrifically, it was cannibalism. One survivor described the decision to eat the deceased passengers in a book written many years later. Our common goal was to survive, but what we lacked was food. We had long since run out of the meager pickings we'd found on the plane, and there was no vegetation or animal life to be found. After just a few days, we were feeling the sensation of our own bodies consuming themselves just to remain alive. Before long, we would become too weak to recover from starvation. We knew the answer. It was too terrible to contemplate. The bodies of our friends and teammates preserved outside in the snow and ice contained vital life-giving protein that could help us survive. But could we do it? For a long time, we agonized. I went out in the snow and prayed to God for guidance. Without his consent, I felt I would be violating the memory of my friends, that I would be stealing their souls. We wondered whether we were going mad even to contemplate such a thing. Had we turned into brute savages, or was this the only sane thing to do? Truly, we were pushing the limits of our fear. The decision to eat flesh from the bodies of their dead comrades was not taken lightly, as most of the dead were classmates, close friends, or relatives. One survivor used broken glass from the aircraft windshield as a cutting tool and set the example by swallowing the first matchstick-sized strip of frozen flesh, with several others doing the same later on. The next day, more survivors ate the meat offered them, but a few refused or could not keep it down. At such a high altitude, the body's caloric needs are astronomical. Additional strain on the circulation system means that much more energy is required to sustain life. The survivors required almost double their daily caloric intake, yet they had next to nothing to feed themselves with. This made the already catastrophic event even deadlier. One survivor protected the corpses of his sister and mother, and they were never eaten. Others dried the meat they'd cut from their dead companions in the sun, which made it only slightly more palatable. They were initially so revolted by the experience that they could eat only skin, muscle, and fat. When the supply of flesh was diminished, they also ate hearts, lungs, and even brains. But all the passengers on the crashed flight were Roman Catholic. Some later confessed that they were fearing 
eternal damnation if they ate the flesh of their companions. Yet according to other survivor accounts, some rationalize the act of necrotic cannibalism as equivalent to the Eucharist, the body and blood of Jesus Christ under the appearances of bread and wine. Others justified it according to a Bible verse found in John 15.13, No man hath greater love than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Some initially had reservations, though after realizing that it was their only means of staying alive, they changed their minds a few days later. One woman had strong religious convictions, and only reluctantly agreed to partake of the flesh after she was told to view it as a kind of holy communion. After yet more of the survivors lost their lives to complications arising from their injuries, and an avalanche almost buried the remaining survivors alive, the decision was made to go look for help. Two of the strongest survivors, Roberto Conesa and Nando Parado, volunteered themselves. Before their departure, Parado told Canessa, We may be walking to our deaths, but I would rather walk to meet my death than wait for it to come to me. You and I are friends, Nando. Canessa replied solemnly, We've been through so much, now let's go die together. And so they walked for several days through seemingly endless snowdrifts, slowly descending the mountain in the hope of finding rescue. Gradually there appeared more and more signs of human presence, first some evidence of camping, and finally on the ninth day, some cows. When they rested that evening, they were very tired and Knessa seemed unable to proceed further. As the men gathered wood to build a fire, one of them saw three men on horseback at the other side of the river. Parado called to them, but the noise of the river made it impossible to communicate. One of the men across the river saw Parado, who hastily scribbled a note, attached it and a pencil to a rock with some string, and threw the message across the river. It read, I come from a plain that fell in the mountains. I am Uruguayan. We have been walking for ten days. I have a wounded friend up there. In the plain there are still fourteen injured people. We have to get out from here quickly and we don't know how. We don't have any food. We are weak. When are you going to come fetch us? Please. We cannot even walk. Where are we? On the other side of the river, one of the horsemen signaled that he understood. Then began a grueling ten-mile ride westward to get help for the survivors, who by this stage were barely clinging to life. When the news broke out that people had survived the crash of Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571, the Chilean army provided three Bell UH-1 helicopters to assist with the rescue. On the afternoon of the 22nd of December 1972, the two helicopters carrying search and rescue personnel reached the survivors. The steep terrain only permitted the pilot to touch down with a single skid, and due to the altitude and weight limits, the two helicopters were able to take only half of the survivors. Four members of the search and rescue team volunteered to stay with the seven survivors remaining on the mountain. The survivors slept a final night in the fuselage with the search and rescue party. The second flight of helicopters arrived the following morning at daybreak. They carried the remaining survivors to hospitals in Santiago for evaluation. They were treated for a variety of conditions, including altitude sickness, dehydration, frostbite, broken bones, scurvy, and malnutrition. A Catholic priest heard the survivors' confessions and told them that they were not condemned for their acts of cannibalism, given the extreme nature of their survival situation. After their rescue, the survivors of the crash initially explained their survival by telling reporters that they had eaten some cheese and other food that they had carried with them, and then local plants and herbs. As it turns out, they had made the decision not to divulge all the details of their harrowing experience until it had been discussed privately with family members. Yet on the 23rd of December 1972, news reports of cannibalism were published worldwide. A few days later on the 26th, two pictures taken by members of the Andean Relief Corps showing a half-eaten human leg were printed on the front page of two Chilean newspapers, El Mercurio and La Tercha de la Hora. Both papers reported that all survivors resorted to cannibalism to survive. To the survivors' horror, rumors circulated in Montevideo, the Uruguayan capital, 
immediately after the rescue that the survivors had actually killed some of the others for food. Damage control was required and the truth had come out. So a press conference was held on the 28th of December at Stella Marie College in Montevideo, where the survivors recounted the events of the past two months. A spokesman for the survivors compared their actions to that of Jesus Christ at the Last Supper, during which he gave his disciples the Eucharist. The authorities, as well as the victims' fathers, decided to bury the remains near the site of the crash in a common grave. Thirteen bodies were untouched, while another fifteen were mostly skeletal, which must have been a truly haunting sight to those who had heard the tales of cannibalism. A team comprised of twelve men and a Chilean priest were transported to the crash site in early 1973. Family members were forbidden from attending to the emotional strain of the task. The men dug a communal grave about half a mile from the aircraft fuselage at a site they assumed was safe from avalanche. Close to the grave, they built a simple stone altar on which they placed a plaque of the pile of rocks inscribed with the words, The world to its Uruguayan brothers. Close, O oh God, to you once this was completed. The team doused the remains of the fuselage in gasoline and set it alight, with only the charred airframe remained. The father of one victim had received word from a survivor that his son wished to be buried at home. Unable to obtain official permission to retrieve his son's body, the father mounted an expedition, financed out of his own pocket, complete with hired guides. He had prearranged with the priest who had buried his son to mark the bag containing his son's remains. Upon his return to the abandoned Hotel Termas with his son's remains, he was arrested for grave robbing. A federal judge and the local mayor intervened to obtain his release, and the father later obtained legal permission to bury his son. The survivor's courage under extremely adverse conditions has been described as a beacon of hope to their generation, showing what can be accomplished with persistence and determination in the presence of unsurpassable odds and set our minds to obtain a common aim. But what such a sterile, saccharine quote fails to reflect on is the pure horror of what it took for those who survived the crash to stay alive. How the human spirit is capable of enduring almost mind-bending horror and committing the most atrocious acts in order to continue to propagation of the species. And whether we like it or not, we all have that spirit inside of us. During the mid-19th century, the United States saw a sharp rise in the number of people who chose to leave their homes in the East to resettle in California or the newly acquired Oregon territories. For many, a new life in California meant freedom from financial servitude, or freedom to practice their own particular brand of Christianity without judgment from their peers back East. Others were attracted to the West's new and exciting economic opportunities or inspired by the idea of manifest destiny. But for one group of migrants, their pursuit of the American dream would quickly turn into a nightmare, one characterized by isolated mountain passes, freezing cold, and stomach-twisting hunger. In the spring of 1842, a wagon train that was almost 500 strong headed out from Independence, Missouri, seeking to follow an established trail that would lead them to the promised land of California. Taking their place at the rear of the wagon train was a group of nine wagons containing 32 members of the Reed and Donner families. The patriarch, George Donner, had spent time in a number of eastern states before finally making the decision to move his family west. At first, heavy traffic on the trails leading eastward, as well as the large number of other travelers, meant that the journey was relatively easy. Traveling in the summer months could be hot and tiresome, but it paled in comparison with how difficult navigation during the winter would be. It was essential that the wagon train make as much ground as possible while it was still possible, for winter was coming, and it would not be merciful. By the end of September 1842, an attempt at a shortcut had gone terribly wrong for the Donner Reed families. Seeking to overtake the Sierra Nevada mountains before the winter arrived, they had successfully traversed the Great Salt Lake Desert, but 
Complications meant that they had in fact slowed themselves down by about a month. Lack of water in the harsh, dry desert had driven the party to near madness and caused casualties among its essential accompaniment of oxen and other cattle. Tensions among the party members were reaching breaking point. In the following month of October, many of the wagons that made up the original party had gone their separate ways, either pushing on towards California or making their way back eastward. In the group that remained, two wagons became entangled and a man by the name of John Snyder attempted to remedy the situation, but he lacked patience and soon began mercilessly whipping one of the oxen. Soon, James Reed, the oldest and most senior member of the Reed family, attempted to intervene and stop the beating, but Snyder reacted furiously to the intervention and turned the whip in his hand towards Reed. A physical altercation ensued one that was only ended when James Reed took out a long steel Bowie knife and plunged it into Snyder's chest. Despite Reed's explanation of self-defense, the party members convened to decide his punishment. United States laws were not applicable west of the Continental Divide in what was then Mexican territory, and wagon trains often dispensed their own justice. Some suggested that Reed should hang for his crimes, but it was eventually decided that he should merely be banished from the wagon train, but on pain of death should he attempt to return. What was once a happy adventure into the West had become a vicious fight for survival. Grass was becoming scarce, and the animals were steadily weakening. To relieve the animals' load, everyone was expected to walk. The trials that the Donner Party had so far endured resulted in splintered groups, each looking out for themselves and distrustful of the others. In one incident of abject cruelty, an elderly man was ejected from the wagon as he was reliant on for transport, being told he had to walk or die. A few days later, the elderly man sat next to a stream, his feet so swollen they had split open. Some members of the party begged the others to wait for him, to show mercy to the party's weakest members, but the others refused, thinking only of themselves. The old man was not seen again. In the following weeks, attacks from the local Paiute Indian tribe were responsible for the party losing almost 40 of their cattle. This is extremely shocking for a number of reasons. Firstly, the Paiute tribe had at first appeared friendly to the migrants, sharing supplies with them and even directing them onto trails that would take them westward. But at some point, the relationship had soured, and the people known for their respect and reverence of the natural world appeared to have no problem slaughtering the wagon's train's animal accompaniment in an attempt to slow down or even stop the party dead in their tracks. With nearly all of his cattle gone, one particular party member stopped to bury his wagon for safekeeping. Two of his number stayed with him to help, but they returned without him, reporting they had been attacked by Paiutes, murdered, and scalped. By the end of October, the party was forced to make camp around Truckee Lake in the eastern Sierra Nevada mountains. Three widely separated cabins of pine logs served as their homes, with dirt floors and poorly constructed flat roofs that leaked when it rained. Of the 60 at Truckee Lake, 19 were men over 18, 12 were women, and 29 were children, six of whom were toddlers or younger. Very little food remained in their supplies and the oxen began to die. Their carcasses were frozen and stacked. Truckee Lake was not yet iced over, but the pioneers were unfamiliar with catching lake trout. The most experienced hunter among them killed a bear, but had little luck after that. Margaret Reed promised to pay double when they got to California for the use of three oxen for other families. She was charged $25, normally the cost of two healthy oxen, for the carcass of a single ox that had starved to death. The mood in the camp was beyond tense. People were only looking out for themselves by this point, but an incoming blizzard would be the straw that broke the mule's back. During the height of the snowstorm, a man named Patrick Dolan began to rant deliriously, stripping off his clothes and ran into the woods. He returned shortly afterwards and died a few hours later. Not long after, some of the group began to eat flesh from Dolan's body. The next morning, the group stripped the muscle and organs from Dolan's body, then dried them to store for the days ahead, taking care to ensure nobody would have to eat his or her relatives. As the days went by, 
more and more of the party succumbed to their desperate hunger and made the decision to consume human flesh. Some were determined to continue hunting and fishing, only turning to cannibalism when there was no other option, but it appears some preferred the taste of human flesh and eschewed the long and tiring hunting trips in favor of consuming those who died of disease and malnutrition. At one point, a scouting party looking for the most efficient way ahead came across two Miwok Indians named Luis and Salvador. They had once been party members, but had attempted to move on when the supplies had run low. At the time they were discovered, they had not eaten anything for nine whole days and were dangerously undernourished and weakened as a result. However, instead of attempting to rescue and save the lives of their Indian friends, one of the scouting parties simply shot them there and then before carving off chunks of their flesh with a hunting knife. On January 12th, the group stumbled into a Miwok camp looking so deteriorated that the camp's inhabitants initially fled, fearing them to be spirits of undead souls who wandered the snow-capped mountain range. Once it was clear that they were in fact the survivors of a disastrous expedition, the Miwoks gave them what they had to eat, acorns, grass, and pine nuts, completely unaware that the group had murdered and eaten two starving members of their own tribe. They were shaken, starving, and had arguably sold their souls to stay alive, but they were safe now, relatively safe anyway. Reporting on the event across the U.S. was heavily influenced by the national enthusiasm for westward migration. In some papers, news of the tragedy was buried in small paragraphs despite the contemporary tendency to sensationalize stories. Several newspapers, including those in California, wrote about the cannibalism in graphic exaggerated detail. In some print accounts, the members of the Donner Party were depicted as heroes, and California a paradise worthy of significant sacrifices. But it seems that sacrificing one's family and friends, as well as losing one's humanity through consuming human flesh, might not be worth any prize, no matter how great. Seaborn Beck Weathers was born into a military family on December 16, 1946, and is an American pathologist from Texas. Weathers attended college in Wichita Falls, Texas, and in 1986, he enrolled in a mountaineering course, later deciding on an attempt to climb the Seven Summits. The Seven Summits are the highest mountains of each of the seven continents. Climbing to the summit of all of them is regarded as a mountaineering challenge, first achieved on the 30th of April 1985 by Richard Bass. At the time, Weathers considered Richard Bass to be a personal hero, an inspiration who made climbing Everest seem possible for regular guys. In May of 1996, Beck Weathers was just one of a total of eight clients being guided on an ascent of Mount Everest by Rob Hall, a representative of a climbing and hiking organization known as Adventure Consultants. The initial climb up to the first set of Everest base camps had been relatively easy for a group of such experienced climbers. All were in high spirits, as climbing the highest mountain in the world was just as much a dream come true as it was a serious, life-threatening challenge. But Weathers had recently undergone radial keratotomy surgery, a surgical procedure that corrects short-sightedness. Developed in the 70s, the procedure has these days been replaced by more advanced forms of laser eye surgery that pose a considerably decreased risk. But at the time of Weathers' Everest attempt, it was the only fix to short-sightedness on the market. But Weathers soon discovered that the recent surgery meant he was blinded by the effects of high altitude and overexposure to ultraviolet radiation, high altitude effects which had not been well documented at the time. Obviously, this was a disastrous, unexpected turn of events that Weathers himself had not anticipated, but it was far too late to simply turn around and head back down the mountain. On May 10, 1996, the day of the final assault on Everest Summit, Weathers confessed to Rob Hall, the expedition's de facto leader, that he was unable to see. Hall, who was deeply concerned for the safety of his clients, insisted that Weathers make an immediate descent to Camp 4, the final Everest base camp before the summit itself. But Beck Weathers had come way too far just to quit, 
and argued with Hall that his vision might well improve after sunrise. Hall was very sympathetic to Weather's reasoning, understanding fully that it was the man's dreams to reach Everest's summit and that he would not be dissuaded from doing so easily. Hall made a compromise. If Weathers rested on the balcony of Everest, a position just 2,000 feet below the actual summit, Hall would return and make the descent with him personally. But Rob Hall could not keep his promise to Weathers, for while assisting another client in reaching the summit of Everest, Hall ran into complications and tragically lost his life further up the mountain. Upon hearing the news, Beck Weathers immediately began descending with another guide, one by the name of Michael Groom. The pair was short roping down the mountain, taking their time due to Weathers' poor eyesight, when Groom saw dark clouds on the horizon, storm clouds that were headed towards their current position at dangerously high speeds. When the blizzard struck, Weathers and ten other climbers became disoriented in the storm and could not find Camp 4. By the time there was a break in the storm several hours later, Weathers had been so weakened that he and four other men and women were left there so the others could summon help. Anatoly Bokriv, a guide on another expedition, came and rescued several climbers. But during that time, Weathers had stood up and disappeared into the night. The next day, another client on Hall's team, Stuart Hutchison, and two Nepalese Sherpas arrived to check on the status of Weathers and fellow client, Japanese climber Yusuko Namba. Believing Weathers and Namba were both near death and would not make it off the mountain alive, Hutchison and the others left them and returned to Camp 4. They had abandoned him, left almost halfway up the largest mountain in the world, to die a lonely, freezing death. Weathers was forced to spend the night alone in an open bivouac while an apocalyptic level blizzard raged around him. Not only that, but for some as of yet unknown reason, Weathers ended up with his face and hands exposed to the bitter cold, and throughout the night, he experienced increased levels of frostbite on the aforementioned exposed areas of his body. When he awoke the next morning, not only was he surprised to find himself alive, he was shocked to find that he somehow had the strength to actually walk down to Camp 4 under his own power. Upon encountering him, his fellow climbers were horrified at the state they found him in. They discovered that his frozen hand and nose looked and felt as if they were made of bathroom porcelain. Not a single climber expected him to survive another day. With that assumption in mind, the remaining climbers tried only to ensure Weathers' relative comfort until the final moments of his life. It was all they could do, as there was no chance of receiving serious medical treatment while they were up there so far up the mountain. But yet again, to everyone's utter surprise, Weathers survived another night. Yet it was not without suffering. Weathers was in such a terrible state that he was unable to feed himself, drink any fluids, or keep himself effectively covered with the sleeping bags with which he was provided. His cries for help could not be heard above the blizzard, and his companions were yet again surprised to find him alive and coherent the following day. Beck Weathers was given the assistance he needed to walk on broken, frozen feet to a lower Everest camp, where he was subject to one of the highest altitude medical evacuations ever performed by helicopter. Following his helicopter evacuation from a broad, flat, gently undulating glacial valley, his right arm was amputated halfway between the elbow and wrist. All five fingers on his left hand were amputated, as well as parts of both feet. His nose was amputated and reconstructed with tissue from his ear and forehead. Weathers published his book about his Everest experience and his life, Left for Dead, My Journey Home from Everest, published in the year 2002. He continues to practice medicine and delivers motivational speeches to share his experiences and supplement his income. He still lives in the Lone Star State, and these days calls Dallas home. Sir Ernest Henry Shackleton was born in Kilkea County, Kildare, Ireland on the 15th of February, 1874. His father, Henry Shackleton, tried to enter the army, 
but his poor health prevented him from doing so. He became a farmer instead, settling in the Kilkia area. Ernest was the second of their ten children and the first of two sons. The second, Frank, achieved notoriety as a suspect, later exonerated, in the 1907 theft of the Irish Crown Jewels. Shackleton's first experience of the polar regions was as third officer on the Discovery Expedition of 1901 to 1904, from which he was sent home early on health grounds. But this only left him with a thirst for exploration, as well as a need to prove himself to his peers. This led him to join an expeditionary team who aimed to scale Mount Erebus, the most active Antarctic volcano. For this grand achievement, Shackleton was knighted by King Edward VII on his return home. The British National Antarctic Expedition, known as the Discovery Expedition after the ship Discovery, was the brainchild of Sir Clements Markham, and had been many years in preparation. It was led by Robert Falcon Scott, a Royal Navy torpedo lieutenant lately promoted commander, and had objectives that included scientific and geographical discovery. Although Discovery was not a Royal Navy unit, Scott required the crew, officers, and scientific staff to submit to the conditions of the Naval Discipline Act, and the ship and expedition were run on Royal Navy lines. Shackleton accepted this, even though his own background and instincts favored a different, more informal style of leadership. The Discovery Expedition departed London on the 31st of July 1901, arriving at the Antarctic coast via South Africa and New Zealand in early January the following year, 1902. After landing their equipment and personnel, Ernie Shackleton took part in an experimental balloon flight on the 4th of February, one that set into stone the idea that one could use a hot air balloon for surveillance in such terribly frigid conditions. He also participated in the first sledging trip from the expedition's winter quarters in McMurdo Sound, a journey which established a safe route onto the Great Ice Barrier. During the Antarctic winter of 1902 in the confines of the ice and discovery, Shackleton edited the expedition's magazine The South Polar Times, an endeavor that served to both record the events of the trip and to keep the morale of the crew high with the inclusions of little in-jokes and witticisms that both men and officers could enjoy. According to steward Clarence Hare, he was the most popular of the officers among the crew, being a good mixer. Though claims that this represented an unofficial rival leadership to Scott's are unsupported. Scott chose Shackleton to accompany Wilson and himself on the expedition's southern journey, a march southwards to achieve the highest possible latitude in the direction of the South Pole. This march was not a serious attempt on the Pole, although the attainment of a high latitude was of great importance to Scott, and the inclusion of Shackleton indicated a high degree of personal trust. The party set out on the 2nd of November 1902. The march was, as Scott wrote later, a combination of success and failure. A record farthest south latitude of 82 degrees 17 minutes was reached, beating the previous record established in 1900 by Karsten Borchgrindink. But the journey was marred by the poor performance of the dogs whose food had become rotten and unfit to consume, and who rapidly fell sick as a result. All 22 dogs died during the march, their withered bodies left to freeze solid in the vast, empty, frozen wastes. The three men all suffered at times from snow blindness, frostbite, and ultimately scurvy. On the return journey, Shackleton had by his own admission broken down and could no longer carry out his share of the work. He later denied Scott's claim in the voyage of the Discovery that he had been carried on the sledge. But we do know that he was in a seriously weakened condition. Wilson's diary entry for the 14th of January reads, Shackleton had been anything but up to the mark, and today he is decidedly worse, very short-winded and coughing constantly, with more serious symptoms that need not be detailed here, but which are of no small consequence 160 miles from the ship. On the 4th of February 1903, the party finally reached the ship. After a medical examination, which proved inconclusive, Scott decided to send Shackleton home on the relief ship Morning, which had arrived in McMurdo Sound in January 1903, Scott wrote. 
he ought not to risk further hardship in his present state of health. There is conjecture that Scott's motive for removing him was resentment of Shackleton's popularity, and that ill health was used as an excuse to get rid of him. Years after the death of Scott, Wilson, and Shackleton, Albert Armitage, the expedition's second-in-command, claimed that there had been a falling out on the southern journey, and that Scott had told the ship's doctor that if he does not go back sick, he will go back in disgrace. There is no corroboration of Armitage's story. Shackleton and Scott stayed on friendly terms, at least until the publication of Scott's account of the southern journey and the voyage of the Discovery. Although in public they remained mutually respectful and cordial, according to biographer Roland Hunford, Shackleton's attitude to Scott turned to smoldering scorn and dislike. Salvage of wounded pride required a return to the Antarctic in an attempt to outdo Scott. But he would never get the chance to do so, for soon after he became embroiled in a conflict that threatened the entire world, the First World War. British military soon found a use for Shackleton's Arctic enterprise when the Russian Revolution threatened the entire war effort. He was put to work training and lecturing British soldiers on winter warfare, something that the Russians had long since mastered. He also advised on which equipment and provisions should be provided, as well as the most effective method of belaying troops in sub-zero temperatures. For his valuable services rendered in connection with military operations in North Russia, Shackleton was appointed an officer of the Order of the British Empire in the 1919 King's Birthday Honors, and was also mentioned in despatches by his commanding officer, General Ironside. Shackleton returned to England in early March 1919, full of plans for the economic development of northern Russia. In the midst of seeking capital, his plans floundered when northern Russia fell to Bolshevik control. He was finally discharged from the army in October 1919, retaining his rank of major. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.